Hey, welcome, <clears throat> welcome everyone. It's great to to talk to you this morning about uh, the evolution of content services and everything that's going on with Microsoft Content Services. And even just since the SharePoint conference, it's only been just a couple of weeks ago. There was a, a a ton of content that uh, that the, basically a lot of announcements that happened. I'm not sure how many people on here were able to kind of tap into that, even with the virtual summit that that followed the keynote. But definitely there was an opportunity to, to, to share a lot more. And I, I actually was recently on a panel, in fact, four panels that talked about uh, what, what got released at the SharePoint conference. And even at last year's Ignite and last year's SharePoint conference, a lot of announcements, a lot of exciting things happening in this space. What I'd like to do is uh, introduce myself and this topic because, because you know, and when, when we and we actually introduced this with an infographic, kind of talking about traditional ECM and where where we've been with ECM. This this idea of modern content services basically evolving from what was traditional ECM, and we'll we'll, we'll dive into what that actually means. But these enterprise content services or enterprise content management that that, that was now with these. Uh, with with how things have moved, essentially the the analysts and and, and even tech writers have basically acknowledged um, there's a there's been a, a major shift in what used to be content management and how so much of it has has grown beyond the walls of of the corporation and, and what was in the data centers and even that idea that the kind of dream of a monolithic system. Um, and so, what's what's interesting about um, enterprise content management is is this idea that that it was kind of mo monolithic and that it was like one big system, and it, we've acknowledged that that's no longer the case, and that it's much more about services and these content services and how they integrate. And we'll we'll, we'll introduce that and uh, that topic in just a second. So, a little bit of background on myself before I start. I've been working in the SharePoint space. It's almost been 20 years, if you can believe it. Uh, I started at Microsoft back in. 2000 and uh, back in IT, helping take what was under the desk of Jeff Teeper and under the and the, the desk of the Office team, taking those systems of what was Tahoe and Office Web Server and actually bringing them into the IT data center, building a service of what would later be called SharePoint. And it's been a wild ride. If you can see a, a few of my pictures, one of the things I love to do is I love to travel. I love to speak at conferences. And I love to have fun with the community. Um, you may have seen me at the InfoPath funeral. You may have seen my penguin video that went viral on, on YouTube. But that was actually a, a SharePoint tour that we were doing uh, across South America, where we went to Argentina and Uruguay and uh, and. Uh, separate tours we went to africa and uh, asia and uh, I, just, I just love to get out there and meeting in the community and as well our our host for today and uh, the sponsor is is helix and we have john from helix who's going to be talking to us today uh hi everybody we're happy to have you on the webinar and hope that uh, you get some nuggets of information that help you in your journey to information management or Certainly delighted to have you today. Thanks a lot. So we'll be hearing um, from Helix uh, toward the back portion of, of, of uh, the second half of this portion of this, this webinar, be able to talk about some of the things that they, they've done in the space of actually furthering your capabilities um, on top of what, what's the, the SharePoint and SharePoint Online capabilities. Now, I mentioned an infographic, and I wanted to spend a minute on the infographic of this evolution of content services. So essentially, back in the day, and really it wasn't that long ago, the goal was consolidation. It's all about building up this kind of monolithic in the enterprise. Here's where the golden nuggets of our corporation is. This is where we're putting our invoices. This is where we're putting our POs or our statement of works or all our financials. This is where we're putting anything that really matters to the organization from a from a records perspective inside this inside this repository. And the idea was, you know, we, we would build all of this, these capabilities into one system and we try and get everybody to use it. Quickly, we found out, <laughs> and actually over decades, really, we found out that people would still end up using their own systems and it was always a hassle trying to get you know and i don't want to even name names but dozens of different systems and trying to just consolidate them 
and trying to get people just to use one. And it was just always a struggle. Different departments had different needs. That, that idea of monolithic just wasn't there. But that all-in-one and even heavenly customized for the corporation was, was really what was happening in the ECM space. And they were actually quite expensive per user. And so it was always tough. Well, should I give this user access? And the collaboration, for the most part, was not a key part of enterprise content management. It was kind of a bonus. There was always this rub of how much collaboration can we put in there um, versus it should be a records management repository and keeping it fit and clean and tagged. And there was always this wrestle, essentially, with taxonomies as well as tagging and this kind of thing. Take us now into the world of modern content services and what's been happening with these SaaS apps, these um, online applications, software as a service, where not only Microsoft has invested heavily, but often there's, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, this is where a lot of companies have invested, and I will name some names here, in Box and Dropbox and, um, and and uh, the G Suite and so on. There's there. If we're honest with ourselves, there's a lot of stuff out there where, like I said, you you get an acquisition and they've put their stuff somewhere else, and your ability to consolidate that is is obviously a goal. But even the Okta report, which I often refer to, the annual report, those guys who provide single sign-on experiences and logins to Office 365 and and all the competitors of Microsoft as well, you start looking at those numbers and you start realizing, wow, there's a significant portion of customers who honestly have more than one solution in place. They're using both Office 365 and, and the best breed there, but they're also using some G Suite or they may actually be using some box or some Dropbox or, or whatever. And it could be you know, we're using this thing for external vendors or we're using this thing for um, this department that's working with college kids or, or, or you know, recruiting has their thing where they want to make it super easy. And the, for some reason, they haven't necessarily come around with OneDrive or now they're catching up. The reality is SaaS is a big investment and um, the larger the corporation, the more investments they probably have in maybe in up, up to a dozen different environments that are out there. That idea of one solution. So it's, anyway, the idea here is content platforms, hybrid federated solutions where you can actually log into these and it feels like one because we have things like Flow and Power Apps that are actually pulling these things together. There's the value that you actually get out of the creation of your content where you're leveraging AI and leveraging machine uh, machine learning to actually gain a better experience, the flow and, and so on can can actually bring these systems together because when I store something in one place, it can actually flow it to the other system where the other guys may pick it up or, or be in some process, whether it's collecting signatures or whether it's um, adding to that process. And then there's the harvesting and the analysis and extracting content like say you're uploading videos there's extracting the audio and making it searchable and all this powerful stuff that happens in the cloud out, out of these SaaS applications and i think as well this is actually the, the world that uh, helix plays a, a big part of is this now that you've actually got it in a place where you can leverage these 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 services and do so much more with your data and integrate with the chat bots and these other services. So when we start talking about this being an ecosystem of applications, platforms, and components, then we're actually a lot more spot on in terms of what the goal is now, is understanding how to build a cohesive ecosystem of what the organization has and how we can actually build these processes that may be separate for different users. If we start getting out of that idea of the goal of it all being in one system, you're, you're gonna keep hitting your head against a wall, that's not gonna happen. But if you start saying, I wanna build a cohesive ecosystem of applications, platforms, and components, then we see how this vision, this design of modern content services can really, really serve us well. And the investments we make in Power Apps and Flow and in, in these applications we build in this space across our platforms then it really starts to pay off in a huge way. Traditional ECM, when we, again, when we start talking about these things, it really didn't reflect the dynamics of business. 
And so I think a lot of our ability to move on from that idea of this is our ECM system, you know, this is where we put all of our, our data and this is the one that, that rules all. The more we can actually start to say these are applications, platforms and components and we actually need to reflect that across the organization. And actually what I, what I noticed is you really need to start telling a story of what to use when inside your organization. That way people aren't confused because even even companies who have two or three traditional ECM systems, it, it, it became a real problem because it, people didn't know what to use when. And even in collaboration, it was like, well, when do I use this enterprise wiki system and when do I use the social system and when do I use this uh, collaboration system? And if, if they even knew the names, you know, it was a lot of system X versus system Y versus system Z. Um, so a lot of it is being able to really provide functionality, helping the business understand that. You, you shouldn't be surprised that data has just exploded and will continue to explode. Uh, when you start talking about where, thing, where the world was in 2006, where a zettabyte wasn't anything we even talked about, and now we're talking about 2014 with four zettabytes and in 20. 20, there being 44 zettabytes, and you look at that explosion of just how much things have just grown and how it's doubling every two years in our industry, just how, how, how in, in the world really, of how data is just con continuing to grow. 44 billion terabytes, ugh. You know, it's like this unstructured content just continues to grow and grow and grow. The other side of the fence here is talking about the velocity. And when we talk about content services, a lot of it is about velocity, because if you can get your jobs done faster, if you can improve your processing and you can actually deliver faster, you know, it's the, it's the ability to capture, store, manage, deliver, and those, those business processes where we're trying to get the flow of data. And a lot of this is from a, from a systems of records perspective, that archiving. Our ability to not, not only create, we create so much stuff, but our also ability to really make sense out of it and to be able to, to really be able to gather data out of it, you know, the analysis. And a lot of the times it's, if we can't keep our arms around it, it, it and it's, it's like trying to keep up with your data, you know, good luck. It's going to grow and grow and grow. Well, how do you, how do you best take advantage of that? Understanding that your data is going to be doubling every couple of years. So a lot of this is about control. A lot of it is a, not, not about control from a perspective of, I'm gonna have um, my arms tightly around this, but just being able to see how, how this can grow. And when you talk about the, the loss based on how much time people are spending on either recreating it because they can't find it or lost productivity because they're, they're looking to search for content. And this was a great study that was done, and uh, there's, a, there's a number of these studies, but this idea of how much productivity loss there is from a GDP perspective, GDP perspective it's, it's huge. When you start talking about a typical company um, with revenue of a billion dollars is losing 43 million just on time spent in searches, or 36 million of that uh, spent recreating documents. So the value in having the best kind of search, you, you can see here where leveraging, again, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of these signals that happen and, and the power of the Microsoft graph, like the investment in graph has really made search so much better. In fact, it's, it's interesting how search itself has evolved over time. When you look at this vision of, okay, we talked about there being a lot of platforms, and, you know, you could say some of these kind of kitschy solutions where they're kind of point solutions that are just a point solution for just sharing files or that kind of thing. And, or they're focused just on collaboration. You kind of see when you look at the side by side content collaboration platforms versus content services platforms and who's in both of these worlds. And when you look at the leadership quadrant, you're only seeing Microsoft as somebody who's actually in both of these. So they, they actually have a leg up. And when you start talking about the ability to execute, off, not, not necessarily off the charts, but definitely top of the, of the, of the pack in both of these, um, these areas. And so that's, that's why we shouldn't be surprised that Microsoft's a huge player 
with SharePoint and OneDrive and, and this whole Office 365 space, especially with things like Teams even, and how the software just integrates. And, and obviously, there's there's a number of companies who haven't necessarily come up to speed on Teams, but we actually just heard at the SharePoint conference it's now 90% of the Fortune 100 that are now using have some Teams deployment in their organizations. In that inter in infographic, I introduced four different key areas. And, and basically, this is how we're going to be playing out um, for the rest of the, the presentation, is this idea of there's harvesting, creating, coordinating, protecting. And uh, I'll basically dive into the, each of these areas. So harvesting, think about it from this perspective. Discover, reuse, search, dispose, right? So it's, it's this idea of analyzing and being able to leverage from our content and learn from what we've actually got. And that's actually only going to get better as we have things like machine teaching and improvements in AI, as well our ability to get recommendations based on what we've been working on. Really cool kind of capabilities like imagine that when you hit a library, it's using its intelligence and showing at the top those documents that you have either recently viewed or you've been recently working on. And it takes it makes it starts to make sense that, hey, why why didn't we do that back in the day? Why don't why wouldn't it it make sense to highlight the content that I've been recently engaging with, have been looking at it some way or another, or even the ones that my colleagues have been working on, uh, rather than showing me just terabytes of content and tons of files. And then there's the creation side of it. You talk about the ability to create and how much quicker things can be with templates and investments in, in our ability to create and be much quicker from things like design ideas and even content parts where we can actually take content from, from say, a PowerPoint where you recently did some smart art and you want to be able to build that and bring in that art right into your documents. Or you, you, you put together some draft or an architectural design document or, or some really important design. And I've been on a ton of projects where it, it seems like there's some architect or engineer who invests heavily in some design and you want to be able to use that over and over and over again. Or there's some team logo and you want to be able to just use that over and over and over again. Um, so that ability to kind of reuse and to make it easy to reuse. And then the coordination side of being able to share and discuss, co-authoring that real-time collaboration as well as the near real-time collaboration and, and integration with Flow and Power Apps. And I think everybody understands, especially with, with privacy and security considerations, the ability to protect our data, whether it's rights management or auditing and knowing who's viewed a document or, you know, we're talking about things on the edge. Who of our partners or who of our customers has seen what of what we've shared and making sure that we can very quickly turn off things that are no longer needed. I want to kind of just drill down a little bit more here on content services. There's a number of things that go into a platform. Uh, performance, encryption, these bots, the cognitive services and AI, major investments here in, in content services. And this is, I think, a great way of being able to compare and contrast the different platforms that are out there. And then when you start talking about policies, and this is also where when you start talking about the ability to execute and talk about features and functionality, it's not just about dumping documents and picking them up. And again, it's not even just about tagging documents. And it really starts talking about declaring records, who should have access and being able to manage that in a, in a simple way. And of course, there's search and on and on. And I just want to introduce those things. And then there's these, these experiences, these content experiences. When you talk about, it's no longer just about being at your desk. You've got tablets and smartphones and laptops. Uh, and Microsoft's been investing heavily in mixed reality and the idea of the remote assist and your ability to be able to pull up a diagram on site uh, or be able to get help from somebody and then pull in some 3D diagram right in line and be able to figure out which way I should be troubleshooting this system or that thing. And you start talking about what we can do with our phones already with voice and interactivity or, or our cars anywhere in the home. Uh, and this internet of things uh, and, and the, the data that's coming in, uh, there's all these signals and all these things that are different from business to business. All those things 
really those digital experiences add up to be content experiences. These these essentially are signals in creating new new content and in our analysis and in our business intelligence systems that are data that we want to then analyze and collaborate on and build reports that we can then share. And so part of that idea of where we've been is, is kind of going forward. Uh, harvesting. So again, I think the key word here is, is probably search, but a lot of it is reuse as well. Now, if you have not been introduced to Microsoft Search, it's, it's this idea of a one Microsoft project where we're talking everyone from Windows, Office, SharePoint, OneDrive, Stream. In fact, I think they're all here. Uh, Outlook, Word, Sway, Teams, all these things built on top of Graph, exposed in, in, a, in a secure way when you go to search, whether it's in Bing or whether it's in Office. And these signals and, and the way that they're building this, they've actually got a common repository. And uh, Jeff Tieper at the keynote was talking about how this is the biggest one, pro one Microsoft project he's ever been a part of. And what that means really is you're talking about tons of different product teams who are contributing to a single repository and sharing in, in a way that's never been done at Microsoft. It's, it's really quite incredible. Being able to search and get conversations as well as files, as well as groups and locations and people um, and enterprise bookmarks that when you set your bookmarks, those things can surface in Windows or in Office or in SharePoint or in Office.com or in Bing. Like this idea of this powerful search powered by graph and all these signals and then taking advantage of that really, really makes search so, so much better. When you start talking about, oh, we're going to go buy some off the shelf search or enterprise search, you can see how Enterprise search isn't going to do it anymore. We really do need this idea of our data is everywhere and, and in various stages. And whether I'm searching on my, my phone or searching on my laptop or my tablet or living in, in Yammer or in Teams. And when I do search, I want it to be able to pull data from wherever it lives. And, uh, one of the things they've introduced here as well, which, which should make a lot of sense, is these new SharePoint home sites. And they haven't been released yet, but this idea of a dynamic engaging experience designed for your organization where you can go and the content comes to you. You know, this is the place where you can see your news, see your documents, see basically your applications, things, things where you're getting right in front of you, how you can kind of organize your day and a very personalized experience built on top of graph, built on top of machine learning and so on. So they're, they're, they're continuing to build and invest in these experiences um, that will definitely make it a lot easier. Again, that search experience. Imagine anytime you recorded something in video in the past and you put it in the video system and your ability to go find that is only as good as the person who stored it and well, how they stored it. Now our ability to actually have stuff stored in stream and the text, you know, the, the basically voice to um, speech to text where you can actually search that stuff. Even being able to search it on your phone, I mean, it seems like we're going light years from where we were, um, really unlocking information and make, making things much more searchable. And the idea even that this idea, you can even go live on your phone. So our ability to capture so much more content, <laughs> hence why we're going to be having zettabytes of content, right? Um, this idea of more and more what's happening, meetings can be captured and stored and not only, oh, I've got to go watch an hour of content. Now you can actually search, see who said what, and actually get the heads because it captures faces and facial recognition. So many powerful things are, are happening in this space, and it's really a massive leap forward. Um, one thing they did announce at SharePoint Conference was, was this investment in machine teaching. Now, from a knowledge management perspective, I, I've been really impressed with this idea of documents that basically teach based on saying, this is a customer, this is a product, and it gets better and better being able to pick these things up out of documents so they can actually start start tagging or start being able to leverage that document, that data in it to then push that in as metadata. Um, and that's just going to change our lives, I think, because it, those were big, big monolithic investments in our ECM systems on the capture side of being able to say, okay, when this comes in, this is, these are the fields we care about. Let's extract those things. It's going to be much, much easier in the past and in the future.
with, with, with this capabilities. And it's, don't think of it as the future, the future, the future. Think of this as there's a ton of investments today and those investments will continue to increase in the platform you're investing in. And a lot of it's just understanding um, where, where, where you're at and, and what that roadmap is you're building. But as an example, users should, can, can live in OneDrive, but their shared libraries that may be in SharePoint sites are right there. So it's still that being able to have that dream of a single interface for your users and a single kind of ecosystem. And, and it's, it's, it's starting to come together. I think you'll see more and more of that. But as well in this diagram here, check out at the top. I, I mentioned that idea of recommended. And so here you've got your traditional file system what looks like a file system, same kind of golden looking folders, but you can actually see iconography that shows whether it's been shared or not, whether it's been updated recently. There's even kind of a save for later, little bookmark there in the bottom right hand corner. But up on top, you can actually see some nice signals that are actually making relevant content bubble up. How valuable is that? Being able to say, you know, these things are buried in folders, but you can actually see Here's some things where you were mentioned or you were recently editing this one. That's, that's super powerful. That's, man, I wish we had this back in the day. That ability to be able to see what's happening in these, because instead you're staring at these folders and saying, where did I leave that? Or where did I leave off from? Even on my desktop, man, I need, I need this capability. <laughs> and I, I mentioned that kind of save for later, that you highlight that little bookmark. That's a capability that's coming. And these things are just, it's not more more money. It's actually invest in the inv enhancements that are coming to your existing investments. One of the other things they announced at uh, SPC is linked to this slide. Um, how much time will that save us? In fact, from a performance perspective, the ability, if it's, there's 100 slides, it can actually start opening and show you the first few slides and then the background load the rest of them. So those kind of capabilities. Performance was a huge focus this, this last year. They, they talked about search being 20 times faster than it was in the past. And we're talking about indexing, not, not necessarily just the, the, the query, but actually the indexing. So when you add a document, we're talking that document should be cut based on the size of it could become available within seconds to just a couple minutes. And that's, that's, that's huge. And not only that, it's then going to show up in those recommended. It's going to show up. It's going to extract that content out of there and so on. So I wanted to show you just a quick, quick demo, just how, how some of these things are, are making our lives a lot easier. Quick example. I have a um, SharePoint site. You can see here. It's like, but here's my little home. I'm going to go into the compliance site. And in my documents, you can see I've got rich columns now and uh, I've got retention labels going on. When I upload a file and I've got a few pictures here. I said I was a traveler, so I've, I've got a few travel folders. Let's pull something from Azerbaijan, one of the fire temples. Okay, so it's uploading that document. And check this out, notify your team right there. No longer having to go grab, grab all that stuff. I can just top in an email address, click notify, or I want to send it to a, the, the members of this site. Bam. Powerful, huh? The cool thing is, is it, it, what it'll do is it'll actually extract the location data right off of it. So essentially here's our file and uh, what it'll do is it, there's an existing column where it'll actually pull the data in and I can show you on one that I've actually already done this on. Um, it, like I said, it takes, takes a minute so I can show you here's, here's a file from a cruise that I did. I did not type this. It auto extracted us Virgin islands right out of the document. Really, really powerful. It's great stuff. And as well, you know, there's, there's one way to, to view your files and then you can actually switch, you know, you can see, I want to see it in the tile view so you can actually pull it up and being able to see see your documents in, in various ways, even content, say, in PDFs. They've added 230 new ways or, or preview capabilities into our files, so it makes it much easier to kind of quickly see. Even AutoCAD now has previews. And, uh, you know, out of your PowerPoints, you're actually getting, getting so much more. And when there's text in an image, it's actually extracting that text and it becomes searchable. Really, really powerful. The search itself, Look at that. Didn't even type a word. And it's actually using signals that, hey, you worked on this 
nine hours ago or eight hours ago. Here's some things that actually might be relevant to you based on things you did recently or you know, based on what we know you've been clicking on or working on. So it does the no click <laughs> being able to actually give you search, search type ahead type of experience. So even then I start typing and it's it's actually starting to to look at things that actually can be you know more more relevant and actually you know it, it's also using contextual things so i'm in a given library it's using the context of that to say what's in this library that might relate to what he's what he's looking for so this this new search bar on the top follows me and whether i'm in word or or whatever check this out this is going to blow your mind i just started playing with this last night just showed up in my um in my office this is going to blow your mind i love 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 the capabilities and power of this so i'm i'm in a word doc i can search onedrive and sharepoint right inside a word no way so i can i can search for something and it's pulling things back. You can see this one's coming from OneDrive. This one's coming from SharePoint in a, in a library. And not only can I say, oh, we'll go open that in PowerPoint, I can say choose content. And now I'm looking at a slide deck inside of Word. And uh, you know, I may say, I want um, this little diagram. I can pull that right into my document, You know, insert this entire slide right into my doc or, you know, if I'm in Word, I can take stuff and pull it in. You know, it's, I don't know if you guys think, uh, realize how powerful that is. It, it really blows my mind. And as well, one last thing before we jump back to things, because I, I know we're kind of short on time and this is really awesome stuff. But inside of Word, I can interact with, with SharePoint. And not only that, you can see if you set up properties in SharePoint, you can actually edit those right inside of Word. You don't have to go back to SharePoint to add your metadata and stuff like that. I can actually get all my properties here. So depending on what I've actually had, so here's like status and title and tags. If I fill these in, it's actually putting those into SharePoint. So that's, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. And I don't have time to kind of show you how that all world comes together, but you, you get the idea. Uh, in fact, actually, I, this this demo is too cool. I, I was playing with this last night. It was just way way powerful. Watch watch this. So I'm in a, I'm in I'm in PowerPoint. In fact, I'm in the PowerPoint I'm showing you. But I'm going to quickly show you if I just upload a picture. It's a picture from Armenia. Me. What 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 would you say this picture is? I right, check it out. Alt text. A person standing in front of a mountain. That's awesome, isn't it? I mean that that just gives me goosebumps thinking about the fact that it analyzed the picture and is telling me what it is and it automatically added it to alt text now i can double click my photo and then go into alt text a description generated with a very high confidence wow uh, i i agree good job good job that's that's artificial intelligence for you that's that's super powerful and uh if that means i have to hurry up other parts of this deck i'm uh, <laughs> I, I think it was worth it so you talk about annotation that's something that was again announced at SPC. People have been asking for our ability to mark up PDFs, ability to mark up images. That's, 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 that's super cool. So now our ability to kind of highlight things or circle things or add notes on top of things that otherwise you, you got to pay these expensive ECM systems to be able to be able to mark up a PDF as an example. And that's what you want to do is you want to be able to highlight something and say, Hey guys, go, go, go back to the drawing board, change these things. And whether it's a whiteboard or a receipt or a business card, it, it, it can understand what those things are. Um, so you can say pizza receipt, and it'll it'll actually find the receipt. And and at the, because it was a pizza place. There's there's more when you start integrating your data with cognitive services like those examples I just showed you. This idea of it, leveraging the intelligence of saying, hey, go in and extract the content out of this, and then we're going to do something with that. So being able to build these business processes, whether it's flow. Or, or forms with power apps, or that's where you're actually doing your capture. There's, there's so much more now with being able to, to, to build in these systems and leveraging the power of the cloud here. Saw a little bit of rich formatting. There's more of that coming. In fact, it's gonna be even more simple where in the recent past, you had to use JSON to kind of describe the data. And, it, and you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit technical. It's something you did need to kind of copy and paste. Now they'll be able to have kind of this column formatting where, where you can basically choose. And there's a lot more, and I don't wanna, you know, I, I need to kind of hurry up a little bit, but 
SharePoint Mobile, there's the search is super powerful on there. Being able to search for people, uh, the OneDrive Mobile, to get the offline capabilities, the scan capabilities, and those scans being able to show up right in search, convert your data to PDF or Word or PowerPoint uh, from your images, R really powerful stuff. Uh, and then there's that coordination side of things, the flow and power apps, the cognitive. Uh, you have a video, you want to be able to do facial recognition on that. You want to be able to take a photo and say what's in this photo. You can pass through these services and make that part of your, your workflow. So whether it's, whether it's GPS data or whether you want to say what's in these pictures, all of these APIs, all of these, these parts and pieces now are there and they're actually becoming more and more accessible through Flow. And I'm going to actually move past that one because of time, but one other capability is this, uh, this request files. So imagine you're trying to run an event and you want to be able to pull things in. Makes makes much easier to actually collect files as well. So we're going to jump straight into the, uh, to the Themis demo. What we want to show you is Themis content services that kind of speaks to, um, you know, the, some of those pillars that Joel had mentioned earlier in terms of harvesting and, and creating. There's two uh, products in the Themis content services suite. Uh, the first product is Themis information architecture. Um, as you can see, you know, with all the capabilities when it comes to artificial intelligence, um, being able to use the rich list formatting, it really relies on a proper information architecture to be implemented and, and developed within SharePoint um, so that you can leverage uh, all those capabilities along with being able to increase better findability and better searchability. So when we typically engage uh, with new customers that are looking to move to um, SharePoint, um, the first part of that requirement session and design is, is developing a proper information architecture. Um, that process, a lot of times, is um, it could be like pulling teeth. You know, for a lot of users, looking at SharePoint for the first time is um, somewhat confusing when it comes to discussing things about uh, content types, metadata, taxonomy, and whatnot. And so the problem that we have or we face is that dealing with business users that are, that are new to SharePoint and this whole information architecture process, it's not so easy to help uh, or help design uh, a proper information architecture for the first time. Um, so what we tip, tip, typically like to do is show them what SharePoint can do um, as part of a, a streamlined process. The concept of workspace in a Themis information architecture project is creating a sandbox area that represents uh, the different designs that you have for an organization. Uh, typically, we model that um, based on the departments of an organization. Um, so within a workspace, we can assign who um, can be involved in the, in the design as a, an owner, someone who can you know, add additional users, who will be responsible in actually doing the design for their sites, as well as someone um, is, that is used as a reviewer for the, as a sounding board. As a part of our governance strategy, we also rolled out uh, permissions that are standardized across the site. A lot of times the SharePoint permissions that come out of the box are very loose in terms of regulating who can do what. We tend to create our own um, permission sets to restrict certain things like being able to manage lists and libraries. Now this takes away the ability to create new document libraries and lists, but what it allows us to do is make sure that the content types and, and fields and all that uh, information architecture that we've designed with the groups are, are remain intact and no one, uh, no more user won't be able to adjust it. So once a uh, project has been created, we can go start off with the actual site design. Um, as you can see here, the in the workspace dropdown, we have the three workspaces that we created, one for communications, finance, human resources. Um, then we have this concept of an enterprise workspace. The enterprise workspace, again, is owned by the information architect, managed by the information architect, where they're able to promote things into the enterprise workspace that can be used, reused across multiple sites. So I'll jump into the finance workspace here. I'll have the finance site already uh, added, along with the different libraries. So a document library in SharePoint is essentially a, folder, or a file repository. And as you can see here, we have all the capabilities uh, in terms of configuring a document library uh, as you would in, in SharePoint via the browser. Uh, we can assign different permissions to this library um, that would differ from the site, assign default values, 
as well as assigning or creating views for that particular library based on the content types that you've already associated to. So the idea here is basically create an initial uh, site design for the particular business function and determine what are your top level folders, in this case, what are your document libraries, and within each of those libraries, determine what kind of types or what metadata fields you want to tag to the documents being uploaded into the system. When you select the content types dropdown, what you get is a list of available content types. This is, to us, very powerful. Um, a lot of times when we engage with business users um, or creating using Themis for the first time, we're preloading the system with a bunch of already well-known content types that you know we've had uh, used in the past on previous projects, and we make that um, enterprise so that it becomes available. Um, so when we talk to a, a, you know, a certain business function and they say they want, let's say, an accounts payable document, there's already a content type for them to use, or maybe they're dealing with projects, there's a project document content type they can use. What's nice about that is if people are visual, they want to start off with something that already exists and maybe cater to their needs. It's like creating a new Word document where you get a, a template for an invoice or a uh, timesheet and you have something to start off with. It accelerates the process of designing your, your sites. Once you have the sites developed and you can do things uh, um, you know, in terms of adding new content types and, and fields, I won't go into all the, uh, the details here. I'll quickly show what a con creating a new content type consists of. You can give it a name, project document. Again, you can define the base content type uh, based on what you have available, or if you want to use one from SharePoint, you can select show based uh, types and click on document and then from here you can add all the different fields um, that are available in, in SharePoint in terms of the types. So we have choice, currency, data time, as well as manage metadata. Pick one here under the enterprise taxonomy and let's just pick the, the country and call this a country field. Click on save and I've added a new field to the uh, project document. And I really want to quickly show you that because, as you can see, it took you know very little steps to create a content type and create a field. If we were to do this in SharePoint, yes, you can do it in SharePoint, but the amount of steps uh, would be a lot more. And so it just really streamlines the whole process uh, for creating these content types and, and metadata. So going back to our site design, right? We, we have a bunch of libraries. We have content types associated. Um, in this case, we have five libraries. This is where the magic happens. You know, um, when we first started off with information architecture design, we would capture that information either using mind maps or using Excel documents. And then we would present that to the user in order to say, hey, are you guys good with this design? Can we move on to user acceptance testing? Can we move on to production? Uh, and they would give us this very puzzled look. Well, I don't really understand this, um, you know, this Mind map looks great. This Excel document is a little too complicated because we're trying to represent hard code um, data in a, in a tabular format. So the process is a little bit uh, wonky in the sense that, yes, they want to move forward, but they don't really understand that, um, what we're actually doing a lot of times. So we end up basically mocking up the, the SharePoint sites to give them a kind of a visual idea of how this is going to work for them. Well, now within Themis, because we've captured the design here, we have the ability to publish your site design or your information architecture to the underlying platform, which is, um, in this case, SharePoint. So we can either publish the taxonomy, if it's just you know term sets that we need to either create or update, we can publish the content types. Um, and this, for the most part, can be um, you know used to replace your content type up. We have the ability to publish Content types to multiple sites. And now if you want to publish the actual site, we also have that as a, uh, a job as well. In our environment drop down here, um, we're creating a new publishing site where pick our environment, which is the Helix Production environment, give it a name, a new demo job, one, two, three, give it a description. This is just a test. Click on next. And all the sites that we had designed, I can quickly uh, pick the one that I wanted to uh, publish to a, a demo site, make sure our, you know all the libraries that I've created uh, is gonna be part of that job, click on next. 
and save and run. So what that will do is basically go through a validation process. You can see here it's queued up for validation. It's going to make sure that you know the job um, doesn't run into any conflicts, and if there are conflicts, it will identify the conflicts so that you know you can fix it uh, manually or um, have a way to to override it. And then once the validation is successful, you can proceed with the actual publishing. And then at this point, we would now invite our business users who's involved in our design to take a look at the site. They get a feel of how you know these metadata and contents that they've designed and the structure and everything, it all makes sense to them, it all works for them. This At this point, they're in a better position to uh, come back to the uh, drawing table and so to speak and help us define or refine their sites so that when it comes to UAT and when it comes to production, they have a site that's working for them. So what we found is that by going through this streamlined process, by using Themis, we've been able to eliminate uh, the user acceptance uh, testing period it actually becomes part of your, your, your design and requirements um, gathering stage, as well as the QA team or the development team that's usually needed to script out these site builds it is somewhat eliminated or reduced um, dramatically. And therefore, you're able as an organization, as a project team, to deploy your SharePoint sites in a much uh, quicker uh, timeline. So that's Themes IA. Um, so again, it helps you design your information architecture. It helps you streamline the process of um, designing your, your IA and your, your sites, and then having a quicker and accelerated timeline for deploying SharePoint to your end users. The other product that we have is Themis RM. And Themis RM basically implements what we call in-place records management. So the idea here is that going back uh, towards the definition of content services is that you're your documents or your records can be spread across multiple systems or multiple content services. You know, sometimes you have uh, records in your SharePoint sites, and then sometimes you have records on, that still exist on your file share, or maybe it's, it's in another system like Dynamics. The idea here is that uh, we want to keep the records in place with all the work in progress documents that the user is looking for so that it doesn't become this black hole. The traditional way of records management was to have your standalone record repository and when something becomes a record you basically follow this record and it gets moved into that standalone records management. A lot of times we find is that end users tend to not declare things as records because it ultimately becomes a black hole and then it, it becomes harder for them to find it and so the process for you know compliance or making sure your compliance uh, in terms of compliance documents are retained and stored in a timely manner it, it is is a failure from the very beginning. So the idea here uh, for us is to have what we call multiple content sources. In this case, we can add multiple SharePoint sites, uh, whether it's on-prem or online, and use that to build our record repository. Some of the key features that we have is the ability to automatically declare things as records based on a status. So in this case, we have the document status uh, metadata value. If it's marked as final, it will declare that as a record. If it's undeclared from as by a records manager, it'll be marked as work in progress, so it doesn't create a constant loop of declaring that as a record. Uh, we do have automatic classification. So automatic classification allows us to assign a record to a file plan based on auto classification rules. The auto classification rules, I will quickly take a look at an example here for accounts payable record, is that you give it a name, uh, the priority in terms of, you know, one being a rule that will always run. If it's if it has duplicate rules, the rule with the highest priority will be executed first. Within a rule, we have multiple conditions. In this case, this is based on a URL. So for, as an example, if a document or record is found within a particular site, library, or folder, we can classify it based on the location. An additional content type or additional condition would be a content type. So if it's uh, associated to an invoice uh, content type or is in, uh, associated to a report content type, we can classify based on that. And the third step for creating the rule is selecting the proper uh, file plan node. Jumping into the file plan builder. Um, so like any records management solution, we have the ability to create a hierarchical file plan uh, structure. Uh, we have um, five functions here, communications, finance, management. If I drill into finance management, you'll see that 
I have the ability to assign in the title, the ID, the legal justification as to why we're deleting this record or why we're changing and deleting this record based on the retention rule, uh, whether it's a vital record and all the different retention rules that we've configured, uh, as you can see here, whether it's one year or 10 years, and then it's a deletion process after that. The trigger tag speaks to the rules in terms of when the actual retention starts or how the retention starts really. Um, so period-based, meaning you know the retention starts after the document has reached the end of the fiscal year, as an example. Uh, a relationship trigger is based on, or as an example would be, you know a document has uh, superseded another record, and therefore that record can start this retention. And event-based event uh, triggers is based on a, uh, you know a certain event happening in in the future. So an example of that would be a project that has closed out. Um, or a audit case that has been completed. Once that happens, once that event happens, the retention can start, as an example, the seven-year retention. In addition to uh, assigning retention rules, we also have the ability to configure a disposition approval, right? We don't want records to automatically dispose by the system when the retention period has expired. We want to make sure it goes through a review process and through, goes through an, an approval process, and we can definitely do that within Themis RM. Uh, what's nice about that is we can sign this based on different nodes. So if you have financial records that needs to go to a different set of business users, you can certainly do that. If you have human resources records, you can configure a different approval workflow. Once we have the disposition approval workflows in the file plan and configured, as a records manager, I can go into manage records and be able to see all my records based on the, the file plan structure. So drilling into finance management, accounts payable, here are all the different records that have been filed against this particular category. I can see the location of the document. I can click on it and it'll open up the document. I can see when the it was actually declared. I can see when it, the retention actually started and where not a disposition has occurred on the on the record. The idea of this is that you know back in the day when records manager had a, a strong influence in terms of how we store documents, a lot of times it ended up being a failed project because the way records managers see how documents are being categorized doesn't necessarily gel with how end users see how uh, their documents are, are, are structured. So well, what you end up having is that you, you have your end users deviating from that particular structure. So what's nice about Theme SRM is that you allow your users to build the structure in terms of how they, they design their sites and whatnot. And then you create auto classification rules that would then classify it based on the, the file plan. And as a records manager, they can see all the records and all the documents based on the structure that they tend to work with, which is the file plan. Um, so I got a couple of minutes here and I'll uh, wrap it up quickly with the um, disposition report. So, so we have a bunch of records that are up for disposition. Uh, we can create a disposition report. I have one here already created that has nine records. Um, six of them are in progress in terms of disposition. Two have been rejected. Uh, one has been disposed. I can drill down here and see all the records that was tied for disposition. And this is where we go through the review and approval process. As a reviewer, I can see my queue of what I need to review. If I select one here, I can submit for approval or reject it. And once things are approved for uh, disposition, a destruction certificate is now created to give you a a listing of what has been destroyed based on your retention rules. Um, so that's the quickly um, Themis uh, content services outlining um, both Themis IA and Themis RM product. Mm -hmm.